Hello, uh, these are the, the intro introductory unit notes on naming and formula writing. So uh, with this we want to start with an introduction to the periodic table and learn a little bit about that or review that. So um, you want to grab your periodic table and we'll mark it up here a little bit. Now um, don't worry about writing all over your periodic table. You can always print off a new copy or pick up a pick up a new copy in class. But we'll start with metals and non-metals. So most of the elements on the periodic table are considered metals. So uh, we'll talk about what it means to be a metal later on or, or non-metal. So we'll we'll get that. But uh, right now you just want to separate that too. So there's a there's what's called a stair step line on on that shows up on a lot of periodic tables. It doesn't show up on yours, but um, you won't probably want to go ahead and draw this in. So we start up here in the uh, top left corner of boron, and then you go down and to the right, and that's our stair step line until we get to the bottom right here. Now, the, the purpose of the stair step line is it separates the metals from the non-metals. So our metals are left of that stair step line and our non-metals are to the right and above that stair step line. Now there's a couple um, that are a little bit um, in between right through here that are on the stair step line. Those are called metalloids. Right now you don't have to worry about that but metalloids are considered to be right along the stair step line and they, they have properties in between metals and non-metals um, except for uh, boron. Boron is generally considered a non-metal and aluminum is considered a metal. All right, but again, right? You want to draw this stuff on your periodic table because you can always get another copy. All right. Uh, next thing, there's a few groups uh, that you should know there uh, that have special names. All okay? right. So let's start over here. Uh, groups are columns, vertical columns on the periodic table. So this first group right here is called the alkali metals, uh, except for helium. Helium is not part of the alkali metals, even though it's in that column. But lithium on down, those are considered alkali metals. The second column right here, those are called alkaline earth metals. All right, now we go all the way over to this column right here. Those are called the halogens right here. And this last column right here, these are called the noble gases or inert gases uh, because they tend not to interact with the other elements. They don't, they're, they're mostly non-reactive. Okay, and then there's a couple more things. <clears throat> In uh, this middle section right here that's a little bit lower, uh, these are called the transition metals. And these two rows that are pulled out of the periodic table and separate on the bottom, those are called the inner transition metals. And you see like right in here, like this uh, little star right there, asterisk right there. Um, that's where that lanthanide series go. And, and this uh, cross right there, that's where the actinide series goes. So the inner transition metals are just pulled out and separated really so that it just fits nicely onto a sheet of paper. Um, let me make sure I got everything there. So we got the different, uh, oh, we want to get the groups and the ionic charge. Okay. So we got the, the group names. Um, um, groups are columns on the periodic table. All right. Periods are rows on the periodic table. Okay. So periods are these horizontal rows. Groups are the vertical columns. Okay. Now, in terms of what's more important, um, groups tend to be more important. So if you're asked, like, which elements are most similar to calcium, you would look right above it and right below it. You'd go magnesium and strontium, uh, not, not uh, potassium and scandium. So the, the groups tend to have similar chemical and physical properties. Right? Uh, then the last thing with this is... Uh, ionic charges, as in what charges do they tend to form, and, and this goes into their electron structure, which we'll talk about later, um, and they want to get to the octet rule, but for now you just want to know the charges that these uh, elements will tend to form. So we'll start here with the alkaline metals. They tend to form plus one ions. Alkaline earth metals, they tend to form plus two ions. 
the transition metals in here do some different things because uh, they, they have a different uh, arrangement of electrons. But there are two elements in here that always have the same charge, and you want to know that. Zinc right here is always positive 2, and silver right here is always positive 1. You want to know those two. And then uh, aluminum is always a plus 3. The, the elements in the, the carbon group right here, um, they tend to share electrons more than, than gain or lose them. Uh, tin and lead down here are a little bit different. They're a special case, but don't worry about charges for this group. Um, this group right here, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, they tend to form negative 3 ions. This group tends to form negative 3 ions. This group tends to form negative 2 ions. The halogen forms negative 1 ions. And then the noble gases, they don't, they don't produce ions. They, they tend to stay just how they are. All right, so you want to know the, the names of those groups, and you want to know the ionic charge that those uh, elements in those groups will tend to form. The uh, inner transition metals, don't worry about uh, charges on those. And really, to be honest, we really don't do a whole lot with inner transition metals. Okay, so right now we're working on naming these things. Uh, so the first type, and there's, there's a few different types. The first one is called binary ionic compound. So binary means that there's two things. Um, ionic means that there's going to be a positive ion and a negative ion. So if we go back to the periodic table, the, uh, the metals tend to form positive ions and the nonmetals tend to form negative ions. So if we go back here, this binary ionic compound is going to be between a metal and a nonmetal. All right, so the first rule is the cation. Cation is another name for a positive ion. That's always named first, and the anion, or the negative ion, is always named second. And then the next rule is a monatomic cation takes its name from the name of the element. So the sodium ion is just called sodium. You don't change anything. But a monatomic anion is named by taking the root of the element name and adding ide. So negative ions have an ide ending. So the chlorine ion is called chloride. All right, so now we want to do a little bit of practice down here. So these are some examples of this type of naming. Uh, if you want to try it out, you can pause the video now. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to go through the answers right now. So the first one is potassium chloride. So K is potassium. We don't change the ending of the first one, but chlorine becomes chloride, so potassium chloride. The second one is calcium bromide. Um, this subscript 2 right here, with this type of naming, it's, you don't signify that in the name at all. all right? um, it's just we need enough of each ion to make sure the charges add up to zero. That's why there's two bromides for every calcium. We'll talk, we'll talk about that when we write out formulas. Uh, the next one, aluminum oxide. So Al is aluminum. O is oxygen. You change it to an ide ending, so it becomes oxide. And again, the 2 and the 3 have nothing to do in the name, okay? All right, so that's the first type. The second type, binary ionic compounds type 2. All right, so if the cation has more than one form, the charge on the metal ion must be specified. So there's some metal ions that, that have more than one positive ion that they can form. So most of them are transition metals. Right? So you want to treat anything that's a transition metal with this type of naming. And you also want to use lead and tin. Uh, even though they're not in that, uh, that transition metal section of the periodic table, they can also form several different types of ions. So this is a case where we want to, want to use this type of naming. So all the transition metals and then lead and tin will use this. Okay, but uh, zinc and silver, they only form one ion, so we're, we don't have to use a, 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 this type of naming with those. And then the way we signify which charge we're dealing with is by a Roman numeral. So a Roman numeral indicates the charge of the cation, and here's a list if you're not sure what Roman numerals are. Here's a refresher right here. One, two, three, four, and that, that's usually about as high as you need to go. 
um, but this goes all the way up to 12. Um, elements that form only one cation do not need to be identified by a Roman numeral. So that would be your group 1 and 2 metals, because they only form, group 1 only forms plus 2, group 2 only form, I'm sorry, group 1 only forms plus 1 ions, group 2, the alkaline earth metals, only forms positive 2 ions, and then zinc only forms a positive 2, and silver only forms a positive 1. Um, I could also add aluminum to this list, because aluminum only forms plus 3 ions, but anything that only forms one type of ion, you do not need to use this format, so you don't need to use Roman numerals on these metals. All right. So here's some examples right here. Um, if you want to try them out before I go through them, you want to pause the video right now. Um, otherwise, here's the answers. All right, so this first one is copper one chloride. So copper is one of your transition metals. Okay, and so copper can tend to form uh, can form a plus one or a plus two ion. So to figure out which one it is, you want to look and see, well, what is it bonded to? So it's bonded to chloride. So um, the deal is that the charges have to add up to zero when they're in a compound. So since chloride is a negative one ion, copper has to be a positive one ion to cancel out the charge. So we give copper the Roman numeral one. So it's copper one chloride. All right, next one. PB, that's lead. So lead can form several different charges. So we have to figure out what it is by looking and see, well, what is it bonded to? So it's bonded to two oxygen, sorry, two oxide ions right here. So the oxide ion is negative two. The subscript means that there's two of them in this compound. So two negative twos make it a total of negative four. So each lead has to be a positive 4 ion to make sure the charges add up to 0. So it's going to be lead, Roman numeral 4, oxide for the name. Next one, Fe2S3. So Fe is iron. Iron is a transition metal, so we have to use Roman numerals. So we look and see, well, what is it bonded to to figure out what its charge is? Well, it's bonded to three of these sulfide ions. So each sulfide ion is negative two. There's three of them. That gives you a total of negative six. So the two irons have to have a total of positive six to cancel it out. That means each iron has to be positive three. So we call it iron three sulfide. Next, um, now you have ionic compounds with polyatomic ions. So polyatomic ions are assigned special names that must be memorized to name the compounds containing them. Um, there's a list of these polyatomic ions in your note packet, but I'll, I'll show it on the next page too. Um, a lot of them are oxyanions. And then oxyanions are just a, a negative ion with oxygen in them. And there's a couple patterns for those. So the name of the ion with a smaller number of oxygen atoms ends in eight, and the name of the ion with a larger number ends in eight. And then when you have, when more than two oxyanons make up a series, hypo means less than and per means more than. Those are used as prefixes to name the members of the series with the fewest and the most oxygen atoms respectively. So these apply to the halogens right here.